All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone that's joining us uh, online. Thanks, those of you that are kind of coming into the room here. Uh, I'm Kevin Andrew. I'm the director for the San Francisco Environment Department. Uh, really excited to be hosting our second uh, electric fireside chat. Uh, these fireside chats are really just an opportunity to uh, learn more about people that are making an impact uh, in the environment space that we all work in uh, and that we all care about. And today we have a special guest. It's an, a familiar guest to all of us at the Environment Department. It's our commissioner, Commissioner Angelique Tompkins. Uh, so I'm going to start off with just giving a little bit of background uh, about Commissioner Tompkins. I'm going to call her Angelique from this point on because a lot of the things we're going to be talking about are personal, about your mm -hmm. personal journey. And uh, we talked about whether or not the honorifics make sense when you're when you're kind of doing this. And I think in this case, definitely we want to know Angelique, you as a child where you grew up to Angelique, now Commissioner of our Environment Department. And I'll reciprocate once with director chu <laughs> <laughs> that is the last time last time anyone gets to call me director here um so angelique tompkins is a dedicated and passionate advocate for environmental health currently serving on the commission on the environment in san francisco uh, her work is notably prominent in the baby neighborhood where she's been a tireless advocate uh, trying to illuminate and address uh, the challenges that community has faced in the baby neighborhood um, and the relationship between human health environmental well-being and we're going to learn more about kind of your history there and your connection there and, and your work there. Uh, Angelique serves on the board of directors of the Bay Ecoterium, uh, a climate resilience and ocean conservation organization and on the advisory committee of the Eco Center at Heron's Head Park. She is a member of the Bayview Alliance, a consortium of professionals and community leaders in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhoods and serves as the Health and Human Services Chair of the San Francisco Chapter of the Lynx, a professional African-American women's organization. She's been a driving force uh, behind community efforts, contributing to key policy developments, including California Senate Bill uh, 1000, the San Francisco General Plan Environmental Justice Framework, and the San Francisco African-American Reparations Plan, uh, which have all kind of advanced our essential work in environmental justice uh, policies and programs in San Francisco. And so with that, if we can start off with a round of applause, welcoming our guests. Thank you. All right, so we always uh, start off with just, you're here in front of us sitting in this chair. Uh, tell us kind of what drew you to this seat and all of the work that has uh, we've just heard about and uh, particularly your work with the, the Baby Hunters Point community. Yeah, no, I'm, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, the story, there's always a story behind any decision that you make to make yourself available to community. And it usually starts at home. Um, I can think about walking through and driving through memory lane in Marin County with my husband and my children some 30 years ago and watching him tell the stories of being in his environment there. The idea of how magical and how majestic the space was and what it did to influence him and direct him in his life. Those experiences today are ones that my children, my adult children, my young adults, um, often find and reflect on because they will navigate directly to anything that's outdoors, whether it's coastal, whether it's inland, they'll do that automatically and they'll find their place of respite there. So let's fast track a little bit and think about being a resident in the Bayview Hunters Point. And we have a legacy of um, not only my uh, journey of being in that space for almost 30 years now, but five generations with a home uh, reaching back to 1959 with the relocation of my husband's grandparents there to the baby of Hunter's Point. Each day I can stand 
in my kitchen and look due west. No, not due west. Let's make that di a different direction. <laughs> due east. Um, through a cathedral will, a window that usually has beautiful sunlight coming through it. And I see the gantry crane that's in the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. When I first arrived, it was just an image in a landscape on a horizon to me. And year after year, I started to find more information about what that meant to this community. It's an icon, and it's an icon at one time that represented economic mobility for African Americans migrating to this area. And then it evolved into an icon that represents environmental challenges and health disparities and cancer circles and various other impacts um, as a result of those environmental injustices put upon that community. So when we talk about what um, drew me to being in environmental advocacy was the image that I saw on a regular basis and the investigation that I started to have for understanding what something so simple as an image and an icon could really resonate for the impacts to the community. And so as, as you kind of think through the, the history of that community and, you know, the work in the shipyard and the work of the African-American community and the migration there, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about like redlining and, mm -hmm. and, and that concept. And it's tied to that when you think around the around environmental justice and, and the work that you're working on. Like, how do, you, how do you kind of feel about that kind of intersection? And then also with what we're seeing now uh, and the challenges we're facing now there. Yeah, so yes, so talking about industrialization and pollution, you know, those are very evident of, of impacts, um, redlining and lack of investment in the community, the idea of environmental advocacy. I'm, you know, I myself was drawn into this as well because of a, a little bit more of the origin story of being an inner city youth in South Central Los Angeles and being um, adopted and mentored by an amazing woman who was the first Black Girl Scout troop leader in LA in 1963. And because of her leadership and her influence, um, I was drawn into community advocacy work. Um, I was placed in many situations where we were um, led to have a, a voice for those who didn't have a voice for themselves and to ensure that um, we would fight injustice where we saw injustice. So when I think back about the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard and Bayview Hunters Point in and of itself around environmental advocacy, I think about the strong activism that um, is there with the pioneers and foot soldiers of that battle. You'll hear people that were part of what they called the big six. Um, these are individuals like Alex Pitcher, Harold Madison, Ethel Garlington, Dr. Espinola Jackson, Shirley Jones, and Eloise Westbrook. They were on the front lines. They made a coalition that brought about change in the community. And there were definitely follow-ups that happened with uh, Marie Harrison and Tessie Esther. Yeah. Est and, the, and, you know, that was what led to the decommissioning of the PG&E plant. So this activism, um, this community advocacy, the grassroots nature of being impactful, all of that, you know, is continuing today as we see um, change evolve. And for those of you that, that have not had a chance to see it, there's a, a wonderful mural over at the Southeast mm -hmm. Community Center over uh, on Evans um, of the, the big six that was just referenced by, by Angelique. And, you know, maybe we could just 
start with that. Like, how was that interaction with the big six and how did they kind of influence you? I mean, they've done such tremendous work. I mean, and that overlaps exactly with your time period uh, that you were. Yeah, I did. I didn't get to meet all of them. Certainly some were no longer with us by the time I had uh, transitioned here to the Bay Area. But I do explicitly remember Dr. Espinola Jackson. Um, Fire. 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 Uh, she was just fierce. There was nothing that she wouldn't avail herself to uh, try to conquer and overturn if it was impactful to the community. And um, Marie Harrison, I had the opportunity to meet her. And to, to this day, um, she has that long standing legacy of being on the front lines as well. And I'm so fortunate to know her daughter, Ariane Harrison, who um, established the Marie Harrison Community Foundation for Health and Social Justice. So when we talk about that building, that building at uh, South, the Southeast Community Center, that was established um, in around 1979, but it's newly um, regenerated in the space that now is at Evans and Third a beautiful testament to the big six and the mural that talks about, you know, their contributions and impacts in the community. And, and how about for yourself? Was there like a, a moment or, you know, a lot of us may have like that light bulb moment where it's like, I know exactly what I want to do with my time. Mm -hmm. and, and was there that moment for you in, in kind of, I mean, you have this collective of, of experiences ranging uh, from your youth even to working with the, the big six and working in the baby but was there that moment for you there, it it has the journey's been pretty organic yeah. but there there was that moment where i committed and that was a result of the port issuing an rfp for an operator to run the eco center at heron's head park and i was invited to be an independent voice on the panel to evaluate those who had applied for um, that role. And so um, there were uh, organizations there and I took it very seriously because again, we were looking at uh, a pearl, a diamond in our community that uh, of the Eco Center being brought forth and established in 2010, uh, it took 10 year period to get there by Literacy for Environmental Justice and, and other advocates and, advo and activists in the community, um, Sophie Maxwell being one of them. And, and so through that uh, process, um, the Bay Egotarium, or at that time, Bay.org was one of the suggested operators, as was uh, A. Philip Randolph Institute. And once the process was completed um, and Bay.org was selected, uh, APRI came aboard as um, an, an expert in the outreach space. One of the requirements was that a community person be part of the Bay.org board. And it was very serendipitous in that I had uh, a friend that I didn't have even any idea that she was on the board already of Bay.org. And I got a call from her and she says, you know, we're going to operate the Eco Center at Heron's Head and we need to have a community board member. And I immediately thought of you and I laughed and I laughed because I said, you know, let me give you full transparency. I was there on the panel to make the selection for Bay.org. So fast forward. I've been on that board now since 2014. And it's been immense. And that was the trigger. The fact that I committed to a board that I knew that was going to serve the community. Um, and it was my role to help them understand the community needs and provide that programming and service. I wonder if you could take a moment just to, for the audience and those listening, like talk about uh heron's head and and the eco center and, and what that is and yeah and why that's important so heron's head is, uh, well eco center at heron's head park is one of the um only sustainable spaces in the bay area in san francisco 
Um, they are totally, it's a totally off the grid building. Um, they have rainwater harvesting. They have wastewater treatment. They do native land, uh, uh, native plant landscape. And certainly there's conservation that goes on at that space. But it's, uh, you know, it's a result of remediation um, and an apology in essence, um, a type of reparations to the community for pg and &E and the impact that it had to, to the community. So it, the site itself is gorgeous. Uh, a lot of people don't know about that space uh, in the Southeast center of, of San Francisco. Um, there, there is in the space the commitment to environmental education and community engagement. So there are many, many programs that are established to bring children in, to bring youth in and educate them about what it means to live a sustainable life. And, and I imagine that that really kind of connects the story of even the former uh, conditions at that site to what it is now as kind of what you want to be able to replicate them, uh, assuming maybe in, in other parts of Bayview, not to mention elsewhere. Right, so there's, uh, you know, many are aware that the Bayview contains, of course, super fun sites and brownfields. Um, the depth of discussion that we could have around the Naval Shipyard is immense and, you know, surrounding areas, the commit again, back to community activism and commitments that uh, individuals and organizations have to try and alleviate those those burdens, as we say, there, there's a dispro disproportionate amount of environmental burden on that community. The I'll talk a little bit in depth about um, the work of Dr. Himsa Porter Sumshai, who is a uh, researcher um, in reference to the impacts and, and those being chemical and radiological impacts coming from the operations of the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. And for me, I was alarmed as well to understand that in a one mile radius of that shipyard, there are these cancer cl uh, clusters, um, very much as you see in other parts of the United States where they talk about in the South where they call Cancer Alley. We now have the proof and the data that aligns to findings and reports from the shipyard, uh, from the Navy, indicating, you know, what the elements are, what are what were present in the soil, what were present in the air and the environment, and how those are present, um, and considerable body burdens of residents of the community. Well, and, and even just kind of tying this into something that you mentioned earlier around, you know, A. Philip Randolph, it just got me thinking also as you first started off with, you know, talking about your, your own children. And when you mentioned Marie Harrison, like just that connection, that generational connection that's there, right, with A. Philip Randolph, with Jackie kind of taking the realms from her father. So you think around the Marie Harrison Foundation, like how do you kind of see that playing out just in, in other in other interactions that you're having? Like, do you see that kind of growing kind of commitment as the generations are going on to like carry up and pick up this fight like, like Jackie and Ariane have done? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's our responsibility to help the youth um, direct them in that, in that way. I do it through community engagement. Um, part of the work that I do uh, is around creating events that bring awareness and advocacy and action. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of as it relates to the Eco Center and the role that you know I've had with Bay.org and also as a on the advisory committee there is to to bring an event called Base Splash. And we did Base Splash as a STEM showcase to drive youth to understand more about not only the environment, but STEM itself. And we did it in a very visceral manner. We integrated the arts into it. So if many of you know, if you're in the Bayview Hunters Point, you're gonna see art 
all over the place. You're going to see imagery. You're going to see the fact that, and I, and I did want to bring this in, and I'm so glad you, you're directing me here, is that that's the voice of healing for the community. That's one of the ways that the community uh, drives to lift itself from some of those, again, injustices. And so Bay Splash, um, you know, was created to drive um, not only understanding and, and environmental literacy around environmental literacy, but to do uh, community um, uh, re-engagement to be able to look at the sustainability in the space as well as talk about environmental justice. Well, this being Black History Month, uh, I will not keep it a secret. That's one of the reasons we wanted to invite you here. Um, being a woman of color, being an African-American woman in a kind of leadership position in this space. Uh, Sad to say, it's it's actually more of a rarity than it is uh, than it is common, um, and I can say that just you know in the interactions that I, even though I've had kind of internationally and and even around the nation, it is actually rare to find leaders in the space of, that are people of color. Uh, it's growing, and I think that's kind of the generational almost like trend I see yes. see happening. And maybe that ties also to what you were just mentioning around kind of the your work around youth. But you know, kind of in that spirit of, of Black History Month, uh, you know, we just had you know our African American employees like give a, a wonderful kind of presentation of sharing their own personal journey, and we have a table over there that showcases some of uh, their journey and those pieces there. I wonder if you can talk about your journey, kind of being an African American woman in this intersection of community health environmental justice sustainability how 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 that was for you and also and we can ask maybe follow like where you see that going in the future okay sure um i'll give a disclaimer first uh, you know my approach to this question is one that i've given a lot of thought to and part of that is because i would acknowledge that there are definitely biases that exist and when the conversation of race and gender is is um, present you can't uh, eliminate those biases but i'll give you a little bit of a, a story of my experience um, in the space of uh, my day-to-day -day job <laughs> What we're talking about today are the things that um, I'm highly passionate about and the engagement that I have in community. But I do have a day to day job in in healthcare technology, and I've been in that space for some 30 years as well. Um, I had the benefit of working virtually well before it was ever popular, well before the pandemic and such. And so in doing so, um, we did not have technology at that time where we had cameras available to us, where webcasting was happening. You were basically on a conference line when you had group meetings and when you were engaging, you were engaging just with the telephone. There was no visual. There was no email that showed a picture of you or identified who you were. Um, Fast forward and we now have technology that brings all of that about. Well, on the um, ledge where we just transitioned into that space, I had the opportunity then to now have these tools available and talk to the same clients and talk to the same colleagues who were part of my journey to that point. And at the, at it was really interesting to me to find them saying to me that they didn't realize I was African American. And so that told me that when I step into a space, I step into the space for the competencies that I have, for the skill sets that I have, for the impact that I have. And these are, you know, this is how I usually step into a space. So, you know, I wanted to at least have that as a statement before I went into to more of the question. Um, what I do see often walking into a space is that I'm the only one. I'm the only woman. I'm the only African-American woman. 
I've gotten past that because again, I step into a space prepared, confident, and assertive in the communications that I have if need be. But as an African American woman and um, stepping into this particular space of environment, there is not a large percentage of African Americans that even participate in the environmental dialogue. We are gaining traction. We are entering the space more predominantly, but there's clearly underrepresentation. Um, there's the barriers to entry that we've seen before, um, not being directed to educational opportunities in this area, um, not being able to find support networks or mentors in this space as well. So those are the, some of the things that I think that that we see. So to be part of a community like Bayview Hunters Point and to know that there was Dr. Espinola Jackson and that there was Marie Harrison um, and others that stood the ground for those kind of conversations, that's really um, quite a privilege to have. Um, I think at this point, I would say where we're trying to drive toward is more representation, more leadership, the idea of diversity and equity and inclusion ensuring that positions that you'll find, um, that we're driving our youth to those positions, that we're and encouraging people to participate more directly um, and being able to, to see that that occurs. Now, and and when, when you were just mentioning about your experience kind of behind the curtain, if you will, as, as in your normal day job, uh, I thought of what I, that at the conversations and the HBCU conversation was happening in the city. And my first joke with everyone was that Tyrone, I wasn't the Tyrone you were expecting when I stood up to address everyone, uh, which I get a lot, like in terms of speaking with someone on the phone, like, oh, I didn't realize you were Asian. Uh, so I too definitely share and, and appreciate that. And it, it is, it is interesting, like you, you do have to, you try to look past and it's an example of like how you almost can right like they were they were you were being evaluated or judged based on like what you were producing that's kind of like the ideal situation and and kind of we want this to we want the world to be in where where we are seen as that and yet we also recognize we're not there yet right. um and so how do you how do you balance that that struggle like after you 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 kind of pulled the mask or the curtain was pulled aside like do you and now in this space in a more prominent role like how do you how do you balance both like in terms of the advocacy uh, mm -hmm. and then also just your your background of who you are as an African American woman well I feel I'm authentic and I have integrity and those things rise above um, representation and being um, set in a space that again is race and gender specific um, to to evaluate me for the discussion and the points and the um, basis of change um, that I'm trying to uh, emphasize in, in those those forms that I speak in. Um, I, I feel as if once I'm heard that I don't receive any pushback. That I'm I'm seen to be um, a passionate, committed voice, and and again I'm taking that all the way back to childhood, you know, ages six to teens, where um, my banner was about you know protecting those with voices that couldn't be represented by community. And is that what you hope to impart kind of through all of your youth work is to help them find their voice as well? Oh, absolutely. To help youth find their voice, to help them stand in a space that they clearly um, should help to drive the future. Um, we we oftentimes as adults want to dictate what the needs are or what the solution should be and not welcome the voices of all of those who are uh, stakeholders in this conversation. So youth, you know, it's it's Im, Im, 
quite motivating and, and inspiring to hear what they'll come to the table with. Um, and so they should be they should be part of the conversation. Absolutely. You have some examples of some of the uh, brilliant ideas you've heard from from youth. Um, I would say that if you take them out into the eco center environment, they'll talk about um, what it will be, what it's like to do the wastewater treatment and have better ideas about bringing those, you know, bringing waste into the community. Um, they look at things more simply than we do. It's oftentimes that it's an easier type of solution than one that has a lot of complexity, complexity to it. So even with rainwater harvesting, um, you know, we're trying to make sure that it goes into areas and, and is collected. And they'll say, they'll ask a question as to, well, isn't there something that we can do in real time to make sure that the surrounding landscape has the, the, the definite hydration that it needs? And they'll, you know, they'll use things, plastic tubing and such to, to make sure that that gets, you know, directed to these plant areas. Um, without having to go underground and create, you know, again, more sophisticated types of systems. So tell me about your, as, as we're kind of wrapping up kind of this interview portion and we open it up to questions, what's your hope? Like, paint a picture for us for where you would like to see the Baby Hunters Point, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road after you know you've passed on the torch to you know someone else like what is that torch you're passing on to someone else look like i think it's one where equity is exceptionally um present that it's actually not something you have to drive toward that it just naturally exists um and and exists from the the, the point of view that the balance, as you use the term balance, that we don't want to necessarily balance burden and benefit because burden shouldn't even exist anymore. It should be benefit that should be part of the present. And what does that benefit look like? How does that benefit um, manifest itself in making sure that there's more opportunity for the youth to be part of the dialogue? that they're part of the solutioning, that they bring innovation to the table, that they have the knowledge and tools and they help create those knowledge and that the knowledge and tools to to drive toward, you know, greater action. There's um, things that we look at a little bit too around making sure that in policy creation, um, that they're part of that that dialogue also, because we can't hold feet to the fire if we don't have a roadmap for what that accountability needs to be. And so they should be part of creating that as well. It is true. Um, it's an important message, right? Because, you know, a lot of what we're having to reverse is caused by the decisions, you know, we've, we've made, right? And we're passing that along. Um, have the youth, like how has the response been for the youth as you've been having this conversation? Like in some conversations, like are, are they kind of angry and upset saying, you know, why aren't you fixing this for us? Are they excited to be part of the, the solution? I say excited, they're excited and passionate. Um, Brandon Patterson, I introduced to you. Yeah. Incredible young man. Um, his level of understanding and uh, being able to interpret, you know, what has have been, you know, again, the impacts and decisions, you know, put upon his generation and how he can drive toward bringing together um, his peers to think more holistically about what solutioning looks like. I've, I've not seen that type of maturity um, so frequently as I see it now. Because 
the, you know, the, the advance of social media and technology has have made it so much easier to get information and they, the youth are masterful at it. And um, bec because of that, you know, they also expect change to occur more quickly. And we, we, we need to find a way to drive toward action um, in a much more expedited manner. So speaking of Brandon Anderson, like, you know, he's a African-American male. Uh, we've talked about your experience as an African-American woman. What would you give as your advice to Brandon or what have you given mm. as advice to Brandon to kind of navigate uh, their own journey? Yeah, um, is to find the mentors. Find those mentors mm. that and find that network that you can be part of. Um, I talked a little bit with him too about uh, some areas of making sure that he's um, collaborating, um, that he continues to to grow and invest in his own um, evolution in the space, and that he understands where he's passionate. So when people think of in the environment, there are so many different areas to think about. You know, are you in climate change? Are you in sustainability? You know, are you there to drive policy change? Find where you want um, to put your efforts and focus and then commit to it. Because I even as myself feel quite the novice. And I look at how many years people that I see as again, pioneers and foot soldiers, how many years they committed to being part of a movement. And so it doesn't happen overnight, but it's clearly driven by how you think about um, where you want to invest your time. So I think we're uh, we've reached the point where we're going to open this up to questions we either gotten from the chat or from questions we have from people in the room. Uh, any questions we've gotten so far? Online. Anyone in the room have any have any questions? Because I can keep talking and asking questions all day. So I uh, thought I might offer the opportunity to everyone else uh, to ask. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. How have you seen the landscape change in the last 10 years in terms of uh, equitable access to government resources in the game? Government resources, still a challenge there. Um, we're seeing, again, because of more of the collaboration that's happening, um, that we're able to enter into those conversations but again, the pace of support and investment is not coming forward as it should be. There's work being done in viral monitoring. There's work being done in air monitoring. Um, there's some, you know, there's grants that are available that are funding these things now, but they're not part of, say, the general plan or general plan for the city. Um, there's work that I had the opportunity to do and very proud as such um, to contribute policy um, and uh, strategies to the environmental justice framework and also lead into um, discussions and segments on the health uh, portion of the reparations, the African American reparations plan. So for us to be able to advance we certainly do have to have more results, um, expedited, more uh, programming and funding that, you know, is implemented in the communities. Great question. Other questions? Stephen. Uh, I'm kind of curious about your background, like the private sector and like the nonprofit public <laughs> sectors and uh, what are uh, maybe one example of a skill you can use from one in the other space or yeah vice versa. well fundamentally um my skill set is in program and project management so the private sector or the corporate sector that i work with 
is in healthcare technology. And I, you know, had a, such a strong interest from an early age in healthcare because one of it was, you know, just very realistic um, in thinking about career growth. You know, how was I going to be as a young woman um, going to have a future that put me in a middle class or, or upper middle class or the availability to raise a family and support a family? And so healthcare seemed to be something that had staying power. And then in the 80s, you know, technology and healthcare, that intersection really came to be. And I was exceptionally drawn to it because at first I wanted to be a doctor. You know, there were, there, it was quite interesting that, um, you know, the time I came up in high school, um, Catholic school education for 12 years, you know, it was doctor, lawyer, Indian chief kind of, you know, direction for careers. And now there's such a plethora of careers and you can invent your own career, right? But at the time, um, you know, there were very limited, you know, very limited of where you were directed. And um, so landing in that space, again, my career evolved and I stayed in that space because it afforded me the opportunity to provide my children with um, those those great those great experiences that they should have, the education that they should have. My husband and I were very, very committed to seeing that that was happening for them. So, but the transferable skill of program and project management happened in the nonprofit space and the community space very easily. Because you, again, I do a lot of community engagement. And so I mentioned Bay Splash, um, you know, that was a wonderful event. I also, that has evolved into what we call Sankofa Days at the Bay, which is uh, utilizing, uh, again, uh, cultural, uh, approach to celebrating African American environmentalists, and we we're actually going to be at the aquarium of the Bay at Pier 39 on Saturday, April 27th, in partnership with uh, San Francisco Department of the Environment, to to um, acknowledge then where we need to drive environmental literacy for our youth and and climate action for them. So that that. Being a project manager is event based and it means putting together all the tidbits that make for a successful engagement, community engagement. The program management aspect of it reaches into the strategic layer. So when you're doing programming, you're looking at how are you going to drive impact and outcomes? So that again, being more strategic about OK, do these programs then raise um, the advocacy levels of a population? Do these programs then see us have impact around health disparities? And when we talk about environmental health in our communities um, and we, we want to see that at the end, you know, that there is a healthier community or a happier community, you know, how do we do that? So some of the programming might be that it's around the green spaces because green spaces are aligned to mental health and and respite. I myself, if I don't get to the to coastline on a regular basis, I'm not a happy girl. <laughs> so it's very, you know, it's very wonderful for me to make sure that I can walk and have that fresh environment. You know, we talk about the equity of it, right? That it needs to be clean and accessible to all. Um, so, so the blending of the two, um, there's a quite a natural fit for me. Um, draw, you know, drawing the skill sets from both of those sectors. Great questions. Uh, question back. Oh, Ray. How do we work so that uh, community engagement is more uh, inclusive of kind of new people coming to the environmental? Um, discussion, and how do we make it lasting? The new, new, it's interesting about finding new voices to come into the space, and you've kind of got to find a pipeline, right? Where do you get the pipeline? Um, if you're going to organizations that are trying to, you know, bring about that work in their community, you're sourcing them from there. If you're going to schools, 
um, whether it's elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, you're trying to source them from that space. How do you sustain it? That's, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's a conversation around how, what is incenting, you know, that individual or that population to, to be part of that space? What, you know, we all have those personal um, commitments that we make for anything that we're going to be involved in and how do we get an understanding of what that what that looks like for the individual and that takes some one-on-one -on -one engagement and, and conversation so I don't you know I don't necessarily say I have um, the magic toolkit to, to do all of this but it takes uh, it takes more uh, orientation and understanding of what the community is like and what the individual voices are and how they might contribute and making them feel important about their contribution and celebrating their contribution as well. Any other questions? Uh, I think you focus a lot of or parts of all of your answers on providing mentorship to a coming generation of, of youth of, of, of color that are like joining us in this space. And I think this is something that is often in our mind. I don't think I can speak for everyone in this department, but there are a lot of people of color in this department. And I think some of us found our way here without mentorship that looked like us. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really have a good concept of how to provide mentorship to someone coming into this space that looks like me outside of just, you know, just trying to have as honest a couple of a conversation with them as I can, but do you have any recommendations on how to sharpen that skill specifically? The, you know, in mentoring someone, I think part of it is, do you have a fit? Um, it's much easier to mentor when there's some common ground, um, a common understanding, a common approach to um, why you're engaging. Um, if I think about the mentoring that I had at different stages, part of the mentoring is understanding what the stage of development or stage of growth is for that person and putting um, those kind of challenges and opportunities in front of them. So if if you're mentoring someone and you want them to have um, more confidence in their availability to direct an audience, then you provide them an, uh, an opportunity to speak. And then you give them some coaching and some feedback around how they've performed in that space. Um, you find, you know, if the opportunity is you want to groom them around developing policy, then you sit down and you evaluate with it what is a challenge in a community and think about, oh, OK, well, let's think about how can we set, you know, a direction that will address, you know, what that challenge is, um, turn it into a particular policy statement, and then look to find a strategy, you know, that will actually be able to be implemented. So find the pieces, you know, there's, you can modularize what mentoring looks like and identify some of those pieces and again, engage with, with an individual. And I might add one thing that, you know, recognize that it's even in our own lives, it's really hard to ask someone for help and mentorship is no different. So sometimes you as wanting to be a mentor, you know, offering yourself out there in some way uh, goes a long way to help someone else feel comfortable like, oh, maybe this could be my my mentor. So another piece of advice I put out. So we're wrapping up. I did have a uh, two kind of more lighthearted questions. Uh, given that you're new on, on the Commission on the Environment, uh, what surprised you about the department and what excites you about what the department is working on that? Uh, oh, I, I well, I, let me go with excited. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited about all the youth engagement. Oh. Oh, the, the the ambassador program that you guys just launched. Shout out to the environmental ed team. The ed team is incredible, and and I intend to get to know your department. 
I intend to actually find a way to have conversations with everyone. It's easier for me to step into that education space because that's where I've, I've kind of been. But um, yeah, that's that's what excites me because you know I'm I'm there doing the work in the community of creating really exciting, engaging types of um, events for them. The, even like Base Park is going to come up in September, September 28th, I think it is, and that just launched last year with the Marie Harrison Community Foundation, and it had an amazing first event with many uh, organizations that are doing this work that were participants and now we're driving toward getting more youth. That was the conversation you and I had about getting more youth to be participating in that space. Um, and then what 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 was I surprised about? Um, you can use my example if you were surprised that everyone was an uh, Asian guy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I was, oh, I was so pleased. Tyrone came to my swearing in and it was at, it was at Bay Spark, um, at the Southeast Community Center. And I was surprised you were tall, <laughs> 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 but it was, it was so pleasurable because the brief conversation that we had at the time was I really exceptionally I, I, I was, it was so amazing to me to see how aligned the conversation we were having, to see that the values of this department, he was walking and talking those values. And oftentimes, you know, you don't see that. And so that, you know, I was very pleased by that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, last kind of just general question, what gives you hope? that the planet will be able to address our climate crisis. And what message do you want to pass on to everyone? And then we have a rapid fire set of questions to ask yeah. you, but start there. Technology, youth and technology. And innovation. That was, that's what gives me hope. And a message you want to pass on to everyone? Yeah. Um, again, drive forward with the passion that you have, stay committed. Um, and ensure that the direction that you're headed is one that's collaborative. Uh, multiple voices are needed to be able to deliver on solutions. Uh, they aren't done in silos. It's very important to be diverse in our thought and our approach and our outcomes will be so much better. Well put. All right, these uh, last series of questions uh, are, are fun, rapid fire questions. Uh, Angelique has no idea what these questions are. Uh, so we're gonna see and, and, and test her on, on how she responds. Now, this is, there's no wrong or right answer to any, any of these. Uh, what is either the last book you read or your favorite book? Oh, Prince of Tides. Oh. Would you rather bike or ride the bus if those were your only two options? <laughs> you see, I've went only I, two options. You can't just like. Gosh, okay. What's the politically correct? No, no. There's just the um, answer. I, you know, I probably bike. Yeah, I'd bike. I, 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 the reason I pause on that is because I, I know, yeah, I know what it requires for. <laughs> <laughs> to be there, but it's the healthy option. So I would bike. Okay. Uh, you know, if the zero waste team were to look in your black bin, uh, what's something surprising that we might find? <laughs> oh my gosh. It could be the blue bin or the green bin. We'll, we'll, we'll open it up. Um, well, I don't have a lot of black bin content. Oh, oh there you go. That's a great answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> My green bin um, really has, oh, you'll find a lot of Grubhub. <laughs> <laughs> type of recyclables in there. And green, it's, it's oh, my duty to go to my backyard and, uh, you know, take care of landscaping duties. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
if you had the opportunity to interview someone who has already passed on, who might that be? There's so many. <sighs> Cicely Tyson. Would you like to explain? Yeah. yeah. Um, her humanity uh, was very impressive. I had the opportunity to hear a uh, talk about a book that came out that uh, was inspired by um, her dresser or designer and she was just incredible as as an individual um and her commitment her commitment to you know seeing about equity and such um i that's that's the latest i would say there are certainly other individuals that i would probably want to speak to um I can't think of them right off the top of my okay. head because I would love to be able to tell you one that's from the environmental space, but I think nope. everyone's There's... here doing their due diligence. No, um, no wrong or right answers for any of these. So uh, that was a great choice. If you had to choose paper book or ebook. Oh, <laughs> this is telling the generational preferences. Um, I still I still like to have that tangible book. Mm -hmm. I really do. I really do. So I'd have to say paper book. All right. Final. Actually, I have two more questions. Would you rather have an impossible burger, a Beyond Meat burger, a portobello mushroom burger? Portobello mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> and last one. Uh, when is Earth Day? Uh, it's April. April. I want to say. Oh, do I want to say? April, I, I want to say the 21st this year, yeah, yeah. somewhere uh, in the 20s. So, you know, somewhere in the world, it's it's Earth Day around April 21st. So uh, <laughs> somewhere around. I know Climate Week we're doing, you know, from this year we're doing from the 21st to the 27th. Yes. So let, let's go for, for that intersection of Earth Day. <laughs> As we always say, every day is Earth Day, so yeah. there's no wrong or right answer on that one either. Okay. All right. Would everyone give me the honor of giving her Angelique a round of applause? Thank you, Angelique, for taking the time to come out and, and speak to all of us and everyone online. Uh, we're very lucky to have you as one of our commissioners, uh, and we look forward to working with you. All of the things that you mentioned earlier are so aligned with all of the work that our uh, department is focused on and working on, and we're excited just as you are. Yes, absolutely. All right, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. That's good.